You know, what companies love about international students is they find that they're very hardworking, very dependable, and very smart. All right, so the work visa you want, the H-1B. All right, the H-1B is the most commonly used work visa by international students, and unfortunately it has some severe problems right at the moment. And we'll talk about what those are in a minute. Um, but that's what you want. This is for people, it's particularly geared toward people who have graduated from a university with at least a four-year degree. Uh, that is people in what we call specialty occupations. A specialty occupation is a job for which the normal entry requirement, the industry-wide requirement for entry into that job is a four-year degree in a particular area, in a particular area. Very important that you emphasize that. Uh, now, uh, you were mentioning earlier uh, some this website going global, right? So the cool thing, this is data, these private websites grab data that's public from the U.S. Department of Labor. The cool thing about this data is you can manipulate it according to any of its elements, okay? So one, you can find out what companies sponsor H-1Bs. Two, you can find out how many positions they have sponsored in the past you know, year, two, three, four, five. Three, you can find out how much they're paying for certain types of positions. Four, you can find out what types of positions they're sponsoring for. Lots of different data elements. It's just fun. You could spend a whole day you know, sorting this information by data elements. Okay, So I would encourage you to look at this. Um, it's also useful to counteract, you know, some companies will say, and they come to recruiting fairs on campus, they say, oh, oh you know, we don't sponsor H-1Bs. And you go, well, I looked at this website, and they said last year you did 100 of them. What's up with that? Um, just keep in mind that some companies do not sponsor recent graduates for H-1Bs, but they do sponsor others who are more highly skilled, who have years of experience in a particular area, and that person, they find that those skills are hard to find in the U.S. So you may find, hey, we don't sponsor recent graduates, but we do sponsor you know, people with five years of engineering experience. Um, so that may be a little bit of a disappointment. But, you know, hey, that's, that's life. I like to call the H-1B basics the three-legged stool. If you're missing one leg, what happens with a three-legged stool if you're missing one leg? It immediately falls over, right? Okay? So three-legged stool. One, you have at least a four-year degree, okay? That's essential. But it doesn't matter if you have five or six degrees, okay? If the job does not require a degree, the job has to require at least a four-year degree in the same area as your degree program or very closely related area, okay? So if the job requires a degree in computer science, for example, and you have a degree in management information systems, that probably we would work. That's pretty close, OK? Uh, but if the job requires a degree in computer science and you have a degree in agronomy, probably not going to work, OK? Has to be closely related. And the third requirement is the employer is willing to pay you a US Department of Labor mandated minimum wage. And that's not $7.45 an hour. It's a lot more than that, OK? Depending on the geographic area where you're going to be working and the occupation you're going to be working in. OK, so any of these three are missing. You don't get your H-1B. Like I said, you could have five degrees. But if a department store wants to hire you as a sales clerk, it ain't going to happen. That does not require a degree, OK? Uh, so got to have the degree. Got The position's got to require a degree. And it can't require, it, the requirement of a degree can't be an employer whim. It can't just be because, oh, my employer says this job requires a degree. It has to be an industry standard, okay? The job has to require a degree because of industry standards, industry-wide standards. Okay, everybody understand? Got the degree, job requires a degree. So what are the requirements of the H-1B? So, you're limited to working for the employer who sponsors you for the H-1B. You can have more than one H-1B. You can have a part-time H-1B and a second part-time H-1B, or even two full-time H-1Bs if you're really a workaholic. 
Um, <clears throat> you are limited to employment in, at, with generally uh, for six years with all employers. So even though you work for three different employers on your H-1B, you're going to get a total of six years no matter what. Now the exception generally is, and this is a little less technical than I would like, but just to make it simple for you, I'll tell you that the exception is if you begin, you start the first step of the green card process prior to the end of your fifth year of H-1B, then generally you can get much as much H-1B time beyond the six years as you need to complete your green card. Even if it's several extensions, you can get those to complete your green card, okay? But you've got to begin the process before the end of your fifth year. Your employment, as I said, has to be related, directly related to your degree program. It doesn't necessarily have to be directly related to your last degree program, however. Sometimes we can do an H-1B based on a prior degree. Even a degree from your home country, as long as it's equivalent to a bachelor's degree in the United States, can be used to support an H-1B. Dual intent. What is dual intent? Well, as an F or a J, you're not allowed to have dual intent. You're required to maintain a residence abroad that you have no intention of abandoning, which means that every time you go before that thick plexiglass window at the consulate, you have to say, yes, Ms. Consul, yes, Ms. Consul, I will definitely come home after I finish my degree. No ifs, ands, or buts, okay? Once you get H-1B status, all that disappears, okay? You're allowed to have the present intent to be a temporary worker and the long-term intent to stay in the United States. So some new things that have been added to the H-1B uh, lately, as of January 17th, last year, uh, 2017, uh, Customs and Border Protection, or USCIS, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, can give you a 10-day grace period on the front of your H-1B and on the end. Haven't seen this really consistently happening, so I really wouldn't worry about it or care about it or, or obsess about it. And definitely when you're, at the, when you're at Customs and you're coming through, don't say to the Customs officer, hey, could you give me that 10-day grace period? <laughs> uh, just, just let him process your paperwork or her. Uh, the other cool thing that was added in January of 17 is that it is possible now to get a grace period between two H-1B jobs. And I think the intent here was if you lose your job suddenly without warning, you know, it may be hard to immediately find a new job. In the past, prior to this rule, if you lost your job without warning, you were immediately out of status. And you really had to hustle, hustle, hustle to find a new job quickly in order to stay in the United States. Well, now, theoretically, you have up to 60 days between jobs, but we don't really know. We, we, there have been very few instances where we've seen this applied, so we don't really know when immigration is going to give it to you and when they're not. You just kind of have to ask for it and hope for the best. I'm going to mention this three or four times during the presentation, but there is a quota for most H-1Bs in the private economy, and that means that uh, quota means a limited number. That means that every year there is a lottery for H-1B visas, and that's what I meant when I said earlier our system is broken, and you have to have OPT or perhaps academic training to, as a J-1 to get into the U.S. job market, because if you don't have that, the way our H-1B lottery works it's very convoluted and most employers would be totally turned off if they had to wait for you for the period of time through the lottery and then through the waiting period. Okay, and another thing I'm gonna mention several times is uh, your employer has to apply for you on April 1st of every year. That's when the H-1B lottery opens, okay? Uh, there are gonna be some changes next year and we don't know exactly how that's gonna work, but probably likewise, they're going to have to apply on April 1st during the first five business days of April. Um, <clears throat> we don't know exactly for sure yet, but that's probably how it's going to continue to work. But definitely this year, if you were applying this year, you were, your employer would need to file on April 1st, right on April 1st, or one of the first five business days of April. Again, the H-1B, because of this lottery situation, is one of those situations where no errors are tolerated, okay? 
if the check is dated wrong, if one signature is missing, if one sheet of paper is missing from the application packet, it all comes back after the lottery is over. Uh, you want to make sure that someone who's really super competent is working on your H-1B. All right, so what are the employer's obligations in the H-1B process? Well, first and foremost, you know, anything that's false in the H-1B packet is going to come back to haunt you. So hopefully, in this process, you will be given an opportunity to review all the paperwork that goes to the government, hopefully. Some employers won't allow you to do that, but we do in our office because we want to make sure that everything's correct with respect to you, because if it's not, then you may not get you know, your benefit, you may not get a visa abroad. Uh, so that's really, really important, very important. Uh, for example, just to give you one example, if the employer says in the government paperwork that he's going to pay you $70,000 a year, and then you go to the consul later for your visa, the consul says, okay, let me see your W-2. Your W-2 is your wage rec record for a given tax year, right, or a given calendar year. You present your W-2, and the W-2 says you're making $42,000 a year. And the consul says, eh, no visa, goodbye. And so that's the reason why you have to make sure there is no falsehoods. There are no falsehoods in that paperwork filed by your employer. So they have to also agree to employ you in the geographic location that's set out in the petition. H-1Bs are geographically limited. The reason for that is because of wages. Okay, The wages in San Francisco are not going to be the same as in Lexington, Lexington, Kentucky for a given occupation. So if the employer says you're going to be working in Lexington, they can't all of a sudden transfer you to San Francisco without filing new paperwork with immigration. Okay, uh, the employer has to pay the attorney's fees. Hmm, wow, you're surprised at that, right? Why can't I pay? Well, there's a really good reason. I'll talk to you about that in a minute. And they also must pay all the filing fees to U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. So this is a little bit technical, a little bit complicated, but I want to put it all out there so that you fully understand it. Most attorneys would just say, hey, they have to pay a competitive wage. Well, I want you to understand because I'm a teacher. Um, so you have to pay, the employer has to pay the higher of the actual or prevailing wage. What's the actual wage? The easiest way to think about these two concepts is small, big, small, big. The small is the actual wage. That's the wage paid to similarly qualified uh, workers who are similarly employed at the same work site. So small, right? Same work site, small. Big, that's the prevailing wage. That is the wage paid to similarly qualified, similarly employed people within commuting distance, within 100 miles of the job, generally, OK? So that's the prevailing wage. This is the actual wage. So they have to pay the higher of the two. Why the higher of the two? Because let's say they're paying uh, $70,000 at the place of employment, but they want to bring you in and pay you $42,000. Why does that not work to, for a similarly qualified position? Because it would depress the, workers, the, wor the wa uh, working conditions and wages of those $70,000 employees. If they figured out they could bring in people at $42,000 and put them in that work site, then why do they need to pay people $70,000 at that work site? So that's why it's a labor department concept to keep U.S. workers protected. That's what it's all about. Okay, so what are the fees the employer has to pay? All right, filing fees first up. So we got the regular fee for just the H-1B petition itself, that's $460. Then we have something called the anti-fraud fee that was imposed by Congress a few years ago, and that's $500, that's to combat fraud in this process. Uh, then we have something else called the ACQUIA fee, that's, that acronym is based on the name of a law, which I won't bother to recite. Uh, but that fee is $1,500 if the employer has 26 or more full-time employees, and $750 if the employer has 25 or fewer full-time employees. Then you have dependents. Now, the fun thing about the dependent fee, $370, it sounds like a lot, right, to just pay for your old dependents. But uh, the fun thing about it is you can cram as many dependents in there as you want, 
okay? The only thing you can't cram in is more than one spouse, okay? Everybody else goes in the dependent application. Um, premium fee, $1,410. Uh, in most cases, there is, most cases where you're applying for the first time for an H-1B, there's usually not a reason to use the premium fee. There might be if you're applying for what we call a quota exempt H-1B, you might want to use the premium fee to stay work authorized. And also, uh, if the USCIS takes a very long time to adjudicate your application, you may want to pay the premium fee. The funny thing about the premium fee, it gives you 15-day processing, but at critical times when you really, really need it, USCIS suspends the premium fee for H-1Bs. So you really, really maybe want it, uh, you know, during the lottery, during the first five days, just to make sure your H-1B is approved, but they suspend it during the lottery, and usually for a goodly period after that. So for H-1Bs, it's marginally useful, but it can be used in certain situations. Then finally, what are attorney's fees? Well, these vary a lot, a whole lot. But I can tell you one little secret. Since Mr. Trump has come into office, he's given us a huge headache with H-1Bs. He has challenged many of them. He's denied them. Uh, so attorneys have gone up on their fees. I know our office has. So unfortunately, attorney's fees are not what they used to be. Um, but they vary a lot. So I would advise you, if you're charged, sometimes if you go to work for a small company, company's never done an H-1B before, they'll say, okay, you're the foreign employee. You go out and find the attorney and bring them back here and, you know, we'll talk to them and see if we want to hire them. If you're charged with that function, then look around, shop around, but don't choose the cheapest and don't choose the most outrageously expensive, okay? Go somewhere down the middle is what I would advise you to do. The outrageously expensive, you know, sometimes it's hard to figure out where these people pull these fees out of, but I've heard of H-1Bs as high as ten dollars or $15,000. Uh, the least expensive, there's some weird program, I think, on, on the Internet called uh, LegalZoom, I think it is, among others, that you can do your own H-1B for $299. Okay, I would not advise that either. Uh, so not cheap, not expensive, go down the middle. But do shop around because there are a lot of prices out there. Okay, so who pays for what? Well, as I said before, very briefly, the employer has to pay for everything. Why is this? Because the Labor Department in quite a few and the federal courts in quite a few decisions have uniformly said if you have to pay for it, that means, guess what? It's a reduction in your wages, okay? And we can't allow that. We cannot allow your wages to be reduced by these fees, okay? So the employer has to pay for everything. If they put up a fight when you present this to them, we've got a wonderful advisory that sets out all the enormous, huge fines that employers have paid over the years because they allowed their employees to pay for the H-1B fees. One school system in uh, Maryland was fined $3.4 million. A doctor in Tennessee who employed other doctors, $1.2 million. So, you know, would the employer rather pay a relatively small amount now or $1.2 million in a couple of years? I think the small amount would suit them better. Um, okay, note that the employer is not responsible for your dependents. Uh, now, that's something that you can negotiate, obviously, if you're negotiating and, you know, you have a hot skill, some sort of hot skill, and the employer really, really wants you, you can certainly negotiate for them covering your dependents. You can also negotiate for the premium processing fee, which they're not responsible for, if it's for your personal reasons. If you're just nervous about your H-1B and you want it premium processed, that's not the employer's thing. If you want to go to your cousin's wedding and that's why you want your H-1B premium processed, that's not on the employer. But you can, again, uh, anything in the United States is negotiable, absolutely everything. So if you're in a job interview, and you think, and you've got 10 offers, and you know this employer just wants you, wants you, wants you, you can negotiate a lot. So, you know, be tough. Okay, uh, what's filed and when? So when you go into a job interview, a lot of times you'll encounter employers that have never heard the word H-1B, don't know what a work visa is, probably don't even know that you're a foreign national and you need any kind of special treatment, okay? Um, 
So you need to know kind of the basic logistics of what's filed when and where. So the first thing that goes into immigration is something called the labor condition application. In the profession, we call this LCA for short. The labor condition application is all that wage info and notice info. That's what it's all about, wages and notice. It's the Labor Department's form. It's filed with the Labor Department. They have a statutory authorization to take up to seven business days to process that form. Okay? So generally, it does come back within seven business days unless there's some problem with their system. Um, but remember that seven business days. So you can't go to an attorney on the last day of your OPT and say, please prepare and file an H-1B for me today. Theoretically, that could be possible, but for the labor condition application. You can't file that H-1B until you have the approved labor condition application. That takes seven business days. Okay, so it's a barrier between you and filing the H-1B paperwork. When that, once the uh, LCA is approved, next up is the entire H-1B packet, which contains the approved LCA. It also contains information about you, your immigration history, your qualifications. Uh, it contains information about the employer. Um, it also may contain your dependents applications as well uh, and all the fees. And as I said before, everything has to be absolutely positively correct or the entire thing will come back from the mailroom. And you and your employer are going to be really upset if that happens. Um, Again, I'll tell you that all petitions have to be filed during the lottery period, which this year is the first five years, five days of, of April, five business days of April. Next year, we don't know exactly how it's going to work. It's going to be a little bit different, but probably about the same. Um, if you're in the United States and you're maintaining lawful status, which all of you apparently are, uh, you can change your status to H-1B. You don't have to leave to get H-1B status. In fact, in most cases, it's a bad idea for an F-1 student to leave to try to get H-1B, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, if you're outside the U.S., are you going to be leaving the U.S. right after filing of the H-1B packet for some reason, or you're not maintaining lawful status in the U.S., then you'll have to leave, get your H-1B visa, and come back. And I should mention, you know, all of you except these two, are you Canadian? You walked in late? No? Okay. These two individuals, I think we just have two, right? Um, these two folks over here, everybody has to get an H-1B visa stamp before you return to the U.S. if you leave, right? Everybody. The only exception to that is Mexico and Canada. You can go to Mexico or Canada for up to 30 days. 90% of you, I don't think we have anybody. Do we have anybody here from Syria, uh, Libya? Oh, one Syrian? Oh, you can't do it. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay, Syria, Libya, and Iran. Anybody here from Iran? Okay, you can't do it either. Okay, so everybody except these two guys can go to Mexico or Canada for up to 30 days without a visa stamp and come back. Woohoo! It's a, you have to have certain documents in your possession. You have to be just right, but you can go and come for up to 30 days um, after you get your H-1B status. So that's pretty cool. Uh, you have a conference or something. You don't feel like messing with the visa process. It's complicated. It's lengthy. Uh, go and come. Okay. Um, the cursed quota. So how many visas are there available a year? Well, you're going to hear in the media that they're 85,000. That is false. There are only 78,200, okay, for most H1, new H-1Bs, for people who are working in the private economy and are subject to the H-1B quota, okay? Uh, the reason why there's 78,200, I'll tell you in just a second. So, for people who have no U.S. earned master's degree, there's about 58,200. For those who have a U.S. earned master's degree or higher degree, there's another quota of 20,000. Okay, why is there this weird odd number? Because, remember I asked you before about Chile and Singapore? Congress, in this great wisdom, a few years ago decided, hey, we're gonna do free trade agreements with Chile and Singapore, so as part of those agreements, we're gonna set aside this little cache of visas for them, just them, 6,800 visas a year go to citizens of Chile and Singapore. 
okay? That's called an H1B1, all right? And those visas are available all year round. We don't have this quota craziness. Uh, we do have a quota, but it's not as crazy. But a surprise, surprise, Chile and Singapore use that almost all those 6,800 numbers. So that's why there are only 78,200 visas per year because of those Chileans and Singaporeans. People who were H-1B in the past, but you're no longer in H-1B status. Anybody? Nobody. Okay, usually in my audiences, there are three or four people who were H-1B in the past, but they said to themselves, hey, I've worked for Microsoft for two years. You know, it would really help my career if I went back to school and got an MBA. And they change back to F-1 status. They go back to school. They get their MBA in two years. And they say, hey, I want an H-1B again now after my MBA. Well, Shazam, they've already been counted against the quota because they're an H-1B for Microsoft within the past six years. They're not counted again. So they're exempt from the quota. If you've been an H-1B in the past six years, you are not counted again. So that's a fantastic thing that you all should remember. If that becomes your situation at some point in the future, make sure you put in big bright letters at the bottom of your CV, your resume, I have already been counted against the H-1B quota <laughs> because that's super important for employers. People who work in higher education are exempt from the H-1B quota. And if you're exempt from the quota, by the way, you don't have to do this stupid first five days of April thing. You can apply any time of the year. And even if you're outside the U.S. and you don't have work authorization, it's real simple for the employer to bring you in on H-1B quickly because typically immigration does not suspend premium processing for higher ed. So this school, every school in the U.S. will find somebody they like in, you know, uh, England, and they'll say, make an offer to that person, and in a few days that person will come in on an H-1B, okay? So higher ed is exempt. Employees of nonprofit research organizations and government research organizations. Notice I emphasized research. Most nonprofits are subject to the quota, and most government entities are subject to the quota. City of Lexington, subject to the quota or not? Anybody have an idea? Yes, why? Correct. The city of Le Lexington is not a government research organization. They might do some very minor research, or they might have outside people who do statistical research on traffic or something like that for them. But they're not, research is not their central focus. Um, so nonprofits, again, it has to be a nonprofit research organization. If the organization has a central focus uh, and it's government or nonprofit of research, then you're exempt from the quota. Okay, okay, you, you get six years of H-1B with all employers, one year anywhere outside the United States, okay? A lot of people, there's an urban myth floating around that if you interrupt the six years with some other status, you get the entire six years again. No, that's totally false. You have to be outside the U.S. for one year to get the entire uh, six years again. So an example I gave before, you work two years for Microsoft, you go back and get your MBA, you have four years left. That's all you have. Uh, cap gap. Now I promised I wouldn't talk a lot about OPT because these folks are the experts, but I will talk a little bit about cap gap because this, this all ties in to your H-1B process. Okay, so what is cap gap OPT? It is basically an extension of your work authorization on OPT and your F-1 status in certain circumstances. Okay, and what are those circumstances? Well, one, your OPT has to end after the filing date of your H-1B petition. So if your H-1B petition is filed on April 1st, your OPT has to extend at least beyond April 1st. It can be a long time after April 1st, but at least beyond April 1st. Two, <clears throat> the H-1B petition filed on your behalf has to be subject to the quota and has to have a start date of October 1st, okay? Because that's when you go into H-1B status. You file on April 1st, you don't get your H-1B status until October 1st. Three, your OPT ends before October 1st, okay? So if all those things are present and you have requested change of status from F-1 to H-1B and you stay in the United States while you're waiting for the H-1B, then you get this so-called cap-gap protection, 
Okay. You get an extension of your F1 status and you get an extension of your work authorization. This comes in the form of an I-20, which the folks at the international office will be happy to print out for you once they have proof that you've actually, your employer has actually filed this H-1B petition for you. Normally they want you to bring in the receipt or scan and send them a copy of the receipt. Oftentimes, or most times, pop up in the SEVA system, right, automatically. Sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so they'll print you out an I-20. Do you have to have that I-20 to maintain your status? No, you don't have to have it. But it is nice to have it because oftentimes your employer will demand it because they want to extend your, they want to re-verify your employment eligibility verification. Uh, it's also nice to have it in the future, years down the road, immigration may not be able to figure out, and they're really dumb, okay, sometimes. They may not be able to figure out that you've got this cap out protection. They might say, okay, you were working for this employer from May 15th to October 1st. What was your status during that time? And you go, well, I had cap gap. What's cap gap? Uh, yeah, they do say stuff like that uh, at the district offices. So it's good to have that I-20 just to prove what your status was to your employer and to immigration, but it's not absolutely necessary. You won't fall out of status if you forget to request the I-20. Big question that comes up a lot. Can you travel while on cap gap? Short answer, no. The reason, because you don't have a plastic card and that's required by immigration regulations for your re-entry to the United States. Have you heard of people who traveled in cap gap and gotten back? Probably, but they run a huge risk. Number one, of not getting back in. Number two, because of having their change of status denied. If immigration detects that you left the country while that change of status to H-1B was pending, it will be automatically denied. Okay, you may get the H-1B petition eventually approved, but your cap gap will evaporate and your uh, change of status will evaporate. Okay, can you get an H-1B through starting your own business? Short answer, no. Uh, long answer, it's extremely difficult. <laughs> Um, so I wouldn't, you know, unless it's your only alternative, I wouldn't even consider it. It's very, very difficult. The killer to this situation is you have to set up a board of directors, an independent board of directors that has the power to fire you. Okay, so why would you start your own business and set up a board that has the power to fire you? That's one of the requirements of immigration. So, and despite meeting every requirement that immigration says you have to meet, uh, oftentimes, and I'm just finding the clicker now, oftentimes uh, they still deny the case. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank